I'll, I'll mention this well, because the case is already dismissed. We were hired to as architects for a six-star hotel in Subic because it was it was a celebrated uh, case. One million dollars I signed the contract already for architects fee, engineering and planning. We were instructed by the developer to destroy 366 70 year old trees in Subic for the six star hotel. I returned the contract. I got I got legal cases against me, 50 million pesos. <clears throat> it's about the amount of my professional fees that was contracted. I returned the contract, I was threatened, so many things happened. And then I think Al Jazeera, CNN, and BBC, they came to the Philippines to interview the crazy architect who would give up a million dollars to, to save the trees. And, <laughs> and they asked me to explain how could I do that. I said, a, a 50-year-old tree, the replacement value is 9 million pesos. Because of the oxygen it gave for 50 years, the wa rainwater harvested, the fertilizer gave planet Earth, the cooling effect and the beauty it gave the environment. And those are 73 year old 366 trees. And so it's even higher than my $1,000, million architect's fee. And then they asked me, how are you so brave to do that? And I said, if you believe in your faith, you read the Bible, more than 360 times, 66 times it says, do not be afraid, fear not. So that really gave me the courage to do it. And I was a seminarian, SBD seminarian, Christ the King Seminary, Quezon City. We were told by our German mentors, American mentors, the missionaries, that if you see something wrong and you do nothing, it's a sin of omission. That's why there's so much corruption and incompetence in our country because of the sin of omission. And maybe people are scared of libel cases, death threats, and so on. I think there are only 1% corrupt people in our country. But if we have whistleblowers, truth tellers, even just 10% of us Filipinos, I think we can overcome the 1% corrupt. So there's, there's, there's some hope. There's hope. If there are more whistleblowers and truth tellers, and I've been saying that after the big earthquake, I said that corruption kills because I think several bridges of Pasig River will collapse on an earthquake 7.2. Many government buildings, including hospitals, will, co will collapse maybe because of corruption. Even private sector buildings because of corruption. So I challenged in that my article that my fellow architects, engineers, uh, partners in the building industry, contractors, project managers, they should come out and report if there are corruptions, let's say somebody asks for 20% kickback. Well, did you reduce your specifications? Maybe under steel bars, maybe in the contract mix, bridges, infrastructure, buildings, and so on. So I, I said there, I've been quoted several times, corruption kills. So if you don't report it, it's again a sin of omission. You could save lives by reporting it. Oh, wow, that's that's very powerful. And I'm glad that we have someone like you who actually walks the talk. Thank you very much for that. What are you doing now in Clark that is either groundbreaking or something forward thinking that you would like to see replicated around the country? We plan Clark as a smart city, a Rotropolis, airport driven city. And, and if they implement it, and I think they are doing it, it can be a model for our cities. Like again, uh, integrating play, uh, places to live, workshop and dine and worship within walkable distances or accessible by public transit. The lungs of the cities, parks and open spaces, wide sidewalk, uh, bicycle lanes, public transit, circumferential roads, and so on. And, and we divided into seven districts, like near the airport, airport driven land uses, like the logistic city in Clark, after I gave up that $1 million architect's fee, we were hired by the Emir of Kuwait to plan that logistic city, $1 billion investment. And all the best practices in the world up 
applicable, adaptable to Clark, uh, we have adapted it there. And Clark will be interconnected with fast lanes from Metro Manila. And Clark and other emerging cities and metropolitan areas in our country, they can be counter magnets to the attractiveness of Metro Manila. This Balik Provincia, centralization, and, and so on. Because our country is 400 times the size of Singapore, 350 times the size of Hong Kong, eight times the size of Taiwan, three times the size of South Korea. Mindanao is the size of South Korea. Gimaras Island is the size of Singapore. So potentially we can be 400 Singapore's, 350 Hong Kong's, eight Taiwan's, or three, Sing three South Korea. We have that potential. And when I was elected president of the Management Association of the Philippines, I, the theme that I had it approved was uh, uh, developing a culture of integrity, uh, uh, addressing corruption, criminality, and climate change. And if those, those are addressed effectively, criminality, uh, corruption, and climate change, we should be in the top 20 economies of the world. Because we're number one in the world in, in marine biodiversity. We are number one in the world in sailors. We are number two in the world. We are number one also in call centers. We're number two in BPOs and, and, and number two in, in, uh, in geothermal energy. We have the third longest coastline in the world. In Dubai, they did they not have enough coastline. So, Sheikh Mohammed decided to do the artificial islands, the, the Palm Islands. And we are number four in shipbuilding in the world and, and number four in gold. And we're number, num, number five in all other mineral resources. And we are number 10 in human resources. And Filipino expatriates, I don't want to call them OFWs, Filipino expatriates are the most preferred expats all over the world, whether in hospitals, tourism, construction, and so on, best preferred. So why, why are we where we are today? Because I think, first of all, there's, there's a lot of corruption and red tape. Nobody's courageous enough to report. And, and I think only 0.001% of us Filipinos are whistleblowers. The 98.99% are no longer interested, don't care anymore, and, and or they are scared of, again, uh, libel cases, they're scared of their businesses, they're scared of their life. I've given up a lot of projects when it violates our, our principles. The people first, planet Earth, then we can talk about economic cost and profit, cultural history and heritage and spirituality. I've given up so many projects. But unfortunately, some other professionals take over projects that we give up. You're dropping a lot of truth bombs, as they say, in this day and age. And I think we need to hear it. So we need at least 1% of 10% to be whistleblowers because there's 1% in your opinion who are corrupt and that 1% are pretty much costing people lives. I hope I will not be again. Uh, go to court for saying this. Yeah. Because libel cases, sometimes it's not, it's not like, it's a non-case. But it can be 10 years because there are so many paid uh, false witnesses and maybe paid judges. Maybe, I'm not accusing, maybe. Is it true that there's corruption in the judiciary? I'm asking the question. I'm not accusing. In fact, this Balik Provincia, we should start with the digital infrastructure. So you, you can work in Mindanao for projects in Metro Manila. And, and, and uh, also our working from home. This morning, our internet, and I'm in mean Makati, uh, our internet in our home just uh, was not uh, dependable. So I lost my, 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 my meetings this morning online through Zoom because of the unreliable uh, uh, digital infrastructure. Like again, when you go to this one, we only have two service providers in our country. 
In our country, as I said, it's 400 times the size of Singapore. You know how many service providers they have in Singapore? Five service providers. The city of Dubai, only a city, they have two service providers. The United Arab Emirates, where Dubai is one of the Emirates, they have so many service providers. In fact, elsewhere in the world, <clears throat> you can apply for, uh, as a service provider for telecommunications, like a simple permit, <clears throat> application permit. You don't have to go to Congress to get a franchise. And we have, I think we are the only country in the world to need a legis uh, legislation to get a franchise. So elsewhere in the world, you could have, let's say, like the Philippines, maybe we can have 400 service providers, one in Samar, one in Ilocos Norte, one in Sambuanga, and how many islands do we have? At least 81 provinces. We have 81 provinces, or even just the number of regions. How many islands? Regions. How yeah. many islands do we have? Before or after islands? China? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you rotate the map of the world, the Philippines is right in the strategic center. And because we're taught in even in kindergarten, we are in the Far East because the maps were done in Europe. The uh, centuries ago, the center of trade and commerce was the Mediterranean. The last century was the Atlantic. This century is the Pacific, and we're right in the center. It's no wonder all superpowers and all superpowers are interested in our islands. More than four four hundred years, the the the, Sp the Sp Spaniards uh, were colonized by Spain. Then two years the British, four years the Japanese. Uh, the Dutch failed to conquer us. And even nowadays, superpowers are interested in our islands because of the strategic location, because of our mineral resources. And I, I also mentioned another controversial statement that I, I could not control saying it. Like, only in Metro Manila, we have OFWs. Like the workers of Makati, Fort Bonifacio, and Ortigas, they are six hours away from their families because of traffic. Jeez. So they're practically like expatriates. And I, I hate to use the word uh, OFW because when I was invited to work in Dubai, we were called expatriates. Only in the mid-1980s that the, the good brand of Filipino expatriates were... Uh, were downgraded to OFWs, like, like uh, prisoners of war. We don't call Americans, Japanese, Australians here as uh, uh, as uh, as uh, a, uh, AOWs, OAWs, and so on. But we call our own heroes OFWs. We used to be called expatriates. You know, that's a good point. And uh, some of our regulars here were already saying that before you mentioned it, they were saying, I like the term Filipino expatriates. And I wonder why it changed to that. Do you know the history of why that changed? Who changed it? I don't Was know. It I think we seem, to, uh, we seem to be shooting down ourselves. Department of Labor, I think they were even going to create a, a new department of OSW. My colleagues who went to Dubai, Although I was the first Southeast Asian architect to uh, invited to Dubai, and my family was the first Filipino family there. My daughter, the first Filipino, the first Filipino born there, we were respected expatriates. I was treated with the same package as the Americans and the Europeans. But when Filipinos rebranded OFW, their their salaries packages were downgraded. So I pity those ones who have been in Saudi Arabia for. For 30 years, even their packages were, were reduced because of the uh, uh, OFW. The, 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 the image, yeah, the, the brand. By the numbers. Absolutely. No, I can see what you're saying. And it, it's not something I gave a lot of thought to until you mentioned it. So um, you've given me something to really chew over. The branding alone, going from Filipino expatriates or just expatriates in general, to OFW does does have a certain connotation to it, and it because it gives this perception that it's cheap labor. We 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 downgrade like uh, again another controversial statement I I said even in when I was someone in the Senate, like the bunkhouses after Yolanda in Leyte and Samar. 
I told them it's not fit for human dignity, human habitation. Imagine bank houses were in Texas are used for animals during the cold weather. In the Middle East, it's for the lowest paid laborer, construction laborer, single status. Bank houses, how many? 10 square meters for the whole household, the survivors of Yolanda. So I said they are not fit for human habitation and also dignity of human beings. And you should not even call it bank houses. We should call them transition homes. And I said that in, in the Senate when I was someone for telling that to the international media pick up my statement that they are not fit for for habitation by families. And and then they, they changed the bank houses, renamed it to what I said, transition homes. And I got funders, Tusi from Tusi from Taiwan, the International Buddhist Organization. In fact, I'm going back to Palo Leite, the transition homes were designing permanent homes for the survivors of, of uh, the Yolanda in Palo Leite to give them permanent homes, including place of worship, playgrounds, livelihood, and so on, funded by Buddhists in our Christian country. Well, you know what, uh, Sir June, we're going to leave it there on the condition that, on one condition, that you promise you're going to come for a part two. Can I get a commitment on the air from you? Yes, after okay. five. Because okay. I, after five, we're, we're going to have you again. Office hours. 